Hello everyone and welcome to Nebula Cohort 2 session 6 open data and thank you for joining us for today. Uh, please write your name in the notepad. I put the link in the chat uh, and please answer the icebreaker question. What is your favorite season for uh, all the time? For me it's spring. Uh, so please write it in the notepad and tell us about your favorite. So before we start, let me uh, tell you our housekeeping for our session as usual. So uh, this session, as we said before, it's recorded and transcripted. Please, uh, so if you want to turn off your camera or uh, open it, it is as you like. Also, uh, our code of conduct and uh, community participation guidelines, uh, you will find it in the notepad too. Our steps for any misbehavior, you can contact us uh, on the emails. You will find the emails in the notepad. Also, uh, we will have breakout rooms for today. So please indicate uh, the, if you want to uh, speaking or writing by editing your name on the Zoom uh, and add W for uh, written participation and S for spoken participation and discussion. So, um, we have today Pauline will uh, present for us how uh, using, making, and sharing open data. Pauline, you can start. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. And then into a slideshow. Can everyone see welcome to Nebula 2? Oh, brilliant. Yes. Thumbs up. Okay. Uh, my name is Pauline Carrega. I am a second year PhD student at the University of Manchester. Um, my area of research now, <laughs> I see you. Yeah. My area of research now is um, health and environment uh, data science, I would call it. Uh, and I'm just looking into how to put together health and environment data more efficiently. And I'm also an um, open science enthusiast, and I helped co-found the Informatics Hub of Kenya Initiative, which advocates for education of open science, especially in bioinformatics. Um, but myself, I am more biased towards open data, so hence <laughs> teaching open data. Um, yeah, and today we are going to be talking about uh, using, making, and sharing open data. Um, I know you've gone through a session of what is open data and uh, um, yeah, describing what open data is, fair principles that accompany open data. Um, but today uh, the agenda is going to be, we're going to look again at what open data is. Uh, we're going to do a small exercise on the type of open data that everyone has used before and how that made you feel. Um, and then we're going to get into using open data and making open data. We're going to do another small exercise and then we're going to look into sharing open data and then a hands-on exercise or walkthrough of making uh, data management plans. So yeah. My first question is, what does open data mean to you? So I uh, got very excited and I made a Mentimeter um, and the it's available on the front pad. Um, can someone post it in the chat? Someone did. Brilliant. Uh, and I just mostly wanted to, to create a word cloud today. So <laughs> let's see what that brings up. So yeah, what does open data mean to everyone? Let's put down your answers and then we can see um, what that looks like. Pauline, do you wanna maybe walk through? So add one of your own to show everyone how you've done it. Brilliant, okay. So open data means reusable to me. It gives me three 
entries, but um, sorry about that. I need to make that into a presentation. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Thanks. Well, Pauline's poking the Mentimeter, everyone. You can add in your answer to what open data means to you into the Mentimeter already. Yay, we have that up now. Reusable, accessible for all. That's nice. Um, easily accessible, available online. Interesting answer. Good metadata. I like that one. Available online. I need to ask someone to type accessible again so that it just becomes a bigger word and then I get happy. Ooh, user friendly format. That's a nice one. Great. So we have a um, we have a theme going on. Accessible, accessible for all, data for all, accessible data, uh, easily accessible, that's, um, make data freely accessible, so, um, and then findable, reusable. Yeah, so uh, all these answers are correct. Yes, uh, let's go back here. So accessible, accessibility, that's one of the keywords that was coming up for what open data means to everyone. And essentially um, that is what open data is. It's one of the key aspects of open data. So by definition or um, as defined in the open data handbook, open data is data that can be freely used, reused, distributed by anyone. and it's the key aspects of open data are it's uh, openly available and accessible. It's uh, reusable and redistributable um, uh, and universal participation of it should allow universal participation. Um, and with this, we get some of the major benefits of open data, so how it uh, promotes science. Um, so by making open data um, accessible and uh, available to everyone, that means that um, anyone can be able to see it and use it to verify published results. This means that uh, science becomes um, more critical for people who are doing it because uh, anyone can be able to uh, redo the methods, reuse the methods uh, that they used or a certain uh, researcher used to put out their results. That means with the data that is available uh, for everyone to use, others can be able to question how they question their methods in a good way. Um, I'm not trying to book anyone in a good way that it, they would be able to use some of those methods to try and verify their results. Make science accessible 
for everyone. So by making data available to everyone, it means people who essentially would not uh, have been able to um, have, would not be able to get access to this data. Now they do have access and they're able to open up their minds and um, answer questions that initially they could not because they did not have data that, that data accessible to them. It also makes uh, science more inclusive. Um, uh, I don't know if you've uh, tackled the care principles. Um, and the fair principles, both fair and care principles. So, um, other it's the um policies that are coming up with uh fair and care data principles. It means that um uh, other people are able to uh get um indigenous individuals, for example, they. They feel safe to be able to share their data openly because uh, they're now protected by principles that govern their data. Uh, and for example, in Africa, fair principles and that govern open data, that is reducing helicopter science. So people are now feeling comfortable sharing their data. This is really cool. Um, and uh, Another key benefit is all aspects of the data um, that accompany the data. So metadata and documentation also need to be accessible. So that means it creates opportunities for individuals. Even if your data is not fully accessible, it, that means some of your metadata um, is available for people to use and they can be able to um, recreate that, uh, the data using some of the guidelines that you put out which is, again, makes science more accessible and inclusive and reproducible. So with these benefits in mind, um, I had a question, another exercise, and uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms at this point. Um, I want you to think about type of open data that you've used before and how or where you found it. Uh, and what condition the data was in. So in this question, be very honest. So uh, to bury the lead, was it, did you understand the data? Did you end up thinking to yourself, I should have just collected this data myself to have made the work easier for me? So yeah, going into this exercise, think about all those things, put them down um, in the Prama pad. And then let's see some of the answers that come up. And then we're going to talk about um, making and using open data. Yeah. Do we have um, the rooms available? So I'm just going to ask everyone to um, add the W's and the S's um, and then give me 30 seconds once we've got some W's and S's and I'll assign you all. Uh, oh, it's looking much better now. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, how long do you want the rooms? Did you say five minutes, Pauline? Five minutes is cool. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Doke. I'm going to put six because we might need a couple more minutes to shuffle, shuffle people around, but rooms okay. are opening now. Uh, Benton. Oh no, Sandy has, um, I can assign you now. Okay, I think everyone should be assigned to a room now. Uh, Pauline, do you want to? Oh, let's stop. Okay, so um, great. So I hope everyone had like really good discussions. Uh, floor is open. Who would like to give us uh, the thoughts on what they had in their breakout room? Uh, 
Alan is reading his hand. Yes, please. Uh, hello, once again. Hi. And so I'm just a bit confused about the question. Yeah. So let's say I want to carry out my research. Yeah. And uh, I, I do the background uh, and maybe I, I reach literature review. Mm -hmm. And uh, I need to compare with what other projects have done, what other people have done. Yeah. So I go to the net and I start collecting related ideas and I read about them. Yeah. So whatever data I extract, so how do I answer this question? What type of open data have you used before? I don't know what types of open data are there. Um, okay, that's a good question. Uh, we have um, satellite data, uh, data provided by NASA, for example, and very biased. Let's note this. I use at the. I've been using a lot of at the at and environment data, so I download a lot of um, weather data, climate data that is open. Um, there are some surveys that are open. Uh, so all this. Um, yeah. Those are the types of open data I was referring to. Um, Yo, do you have any open data you've used before? Um, yes. So one example that I would provide is I was curious if the, the roads around my house were dangerous. And I went to the UK government website and I found road traffic accident data that was open and it showed me the geolocation of each traffic accident as an example, but I see a man has something. Yeah. Iman? Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah, uh, I use some data, but also I have something, I have something to share and I have something uh, like to ask as well. So for open data, I don't know if that's called open before or not, but for me it is. <laughs> So I use government, uh, Gov UK, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, when I did my PhD, uh, I was uh, running some simulation study related to some campaign experiment to understand the user behavior. So uh, we, we in the simulation, we want some socioeconomic data. So we used uh, the micro sample data that published in Gov UK about uh, like people who live in UK. The data as a file size, it is really big file. There are a lot of features, a lot of cases, but at the same time, there were a lot of missing values there. <laughs> so also a statistician to handle with missing values is not easy. Yeah. And also for me, I'm not, um, a UK citizen or I was just a student there. So I don't understand even the the the, the meaning of some features and the, the variables. So I have to go back and read that log file. What does this mean and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So maybe now it is better, but uh, still it is one of the good websites for me to get data. And uh -huh. uh, the other thing, uh, we discussed in the room is to be open so is it like always secondary data for open data or it can be primary data so for primary data is according to my understanding you are the owner of the data and you collect it by survey experiment or whatever but also with the new techniques like you can um, uh, scrub a website for example to get a data Right, mm -hmm. so it's web scraping, for example. So is the data in the web is called open? Of course, when we scrape it, it will be like um, very unstructured data. So we need to do a lot of processing until we reach to the like tidy format and ready for analysis. So the question is the data on the web that we're going to like uh, for example, booking, booking.com, the data related to hotels, prices, reviews, and so on. And if I'm inter interested to anal analyze certain th 
things there based on certain areas. So can I consider booking as open data here or what? No. Okay, then. <laughs> Thank you. As I said, beautiful um, thoughts and that was a very good discussion in your group. Um, data from booking.com. Um, the owners of the data, the ones who put up the data, right? The hotels who put up the prices of the data, they've done all the calculations and stuff. And when you scrape it, you're, you're a user. So that becomes becomes secondary data, no? It, it, it is open because they have put it out there for use. Um, <laughs> you're saying, yeah, remember that if you put your own data online and you don't put a license on, people can't legally reuse it. So if you flip that, you probably shouldn't call data that doesn't have a license open, even if it's, I think of it, think of it more like a window, right? The mm -hmm. curtains are open, you can see in, but that's very different from reaching in and taking it out on your own. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, um, Alan, I don't know if I answered your question, and if I did, uh, what type of open data did you use? Have you used them, based on your example? If I can throw back the question to you. I beg your pardon? Um, if we answered your question, uh, what type of open data do you think you used then? Or what, yeah. When doing your literature review. Honestly, I'm still a bit confused. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um. All right, put the question down in the chat and we can go forward and then we'll see what to do, right? So at this point, I should mention that um, when we are thinking about open data, I usually think about it myself. I usually think about it that I am one of two people. I take up two personas. I'm, I'm either a user or creator of open data. So moving forward, having that in mind, um, when, as a user, um, what happens when I want to use open data? So open data can be discovered by a, just a search on the internet um, using some keywords. We have multiple resources that uh, give you access to open data. So journals uh, are a good source of data. Uh, there's always the data availability section of in, in multiple journals that um, allow you to either see if the data is accessible for use. Uh, and it gives you guidelines about, in case it's not accessible, who to reach to be able to get access to that data. We have multiple data repositories out there. So we have things like Zenodo, which are a good source of data, um, data.gov. Uh, Yes, all this uh, a simple web search can also uh, give you, um, provide you with a list of possible resources that you can get, open data sets that you can use for your research. Um, so there are multiple sources of uh, open data where to be able to find it. And uh, I've put up two links in this um, slide. Uh, Kaggle is a good source of data uh, and I use it a lot for practice um, and there's also a site on GitHub that uh, I was introduced to called Awesome Data and I've enjoyed using GitHub as a repository for data um, because it also now gives me um, an opportunity to practice um, citation, looking into licenses and all that. So check out or some data uh, that platform yeah so um absolutely love this um meme 
So yes, I have open data. So is it useful to me? What is this? Once I search, is this? How do I know that this data will be useful for what I want um, to answer as a question in the long run? So this image, I like it because it uh, gives me a sort of list of checks that I can use uh, to answer if the data that I found is good. So is the data appropriate for my project? Um, does it have metadata? Um, yeah, all the necessary questions that you should be able to ask yourself to be able to use that data um, are in this image. And I enjoy using it as a checkbox to be able to look into the data that I'm that I want to use. Uh, important questions when we are thinking of um, using open data, uh, there's a point, um, how should I cite the data that I'm using? So, so a key aspect to think about, to let's think about when you're using open data is you want to cite or acknowledge the person who created this data set. Um, another thing, which was also brought up, uh, are you using secondary data? Is this primary data? So is this the original data or did someone else modify someone else's data? So with open data, it can be, it can create a whole uh, uh, series of steps. Someone modified the original data set to look like this, then they modified it someone else modified it to look like this. So you should always be aware of um, which version of the data set you're working with. Um, and most of the resources that you uh, that you find uh, like data repositories, they tell you the versions of the open data set that um, is available to you. So always be careful to look out for the version of the data that you're working with and if it's useful to you. Um, you can always see who else has downloaded or has downloaded the data set that you're looking to work with. So um, for this, I had an example. I wanted us to switch again to Zenodo. Um, this was one of my searches uh, a while back when I was looking at um, a certain subject temperatures and um, the impact of heat on health or impact of temperature on health. So I like Zenodo as a resource to use for um, finding data because it gives me all everything in that checkbox or in that image I'm able to, um, to see on Zenodo. So I can see that the data is open. Um, it has a DOI that I'm able to cite, which is very important. Um, it tells me the owner of the data and how I should be able to cite it. It tells me the different software that um, were used to generate some of the um, results uh, using this data. Uh, going back up, it gives me different versions of the data gives me visualizations of the data to help me understand the data beta better. Um, yeah, so this was a good example for me. Um, and if I go back, why I enjoy using Zenodo. Um, internet, right. So uh, I wanted to show you uh, the different versions of um, Brilliant, yes, good. So with in Zenodo, you can be able to see that you can, uh, the different types of open data that are available. So this is a good repository. It has uh, data sets that are open. We also have data sets that are restricted. Um, and if uh, we also have data sets that are embargoed, I found a few that are embargoed and uh, Embargoes will would resonate a lot, maybe for researchers, especially uh, in Africa, where um, 
you collect data and you hold it for, for a while before you make it. It is open, yes, but you hold it for a while before you put it out there for other people to use um, because you're not done yet with answering all the questions that you want to answer with that data. So, um, yeah. Right, moving forward. Um, more on using open data, key aspect. Sorry, yeah, Doa. Just Alan asking the question in the chat. So before we moving to the these slides, you can answer it. Uh, question. Do you want me to read it for you? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, he is saying this is the scenario. Supposing I ex uh, ex extract statistics from a certain website article, uh, such as. Uh, 200 million uh, liters of waste engine oil is generated by engine operated uh, machinery worldwide. And his question is, what kind of open data would this be? Hmm. I also uh, covered this question in the notepad if you want to see it in yeah. the shared insights. So you have statistics from a website. Um... Uh, yeah, you just ex extracted statistics. Uh, so, um, 200 million liters of waste engine oil. Hmm. Um, yo, do you want to help me? Could I ask you to help me sure. out with this one? Because it's just sure. I've done this in statistics. Yeah, I think, Alan, my interpretation here would be that this is maybe secondary data, but it's not necessarily something that's going to be terribly useful unless you don't have anything better because you're scraping, you're manually extracting it from an article. So I'd say it's, yeah, maybe secondary data, Possibly, in fact, probably you don't have the license to reuse it, except maybe as uh, fair use. This is also the place where I hold up the sign and say, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and where possible, I would always prefer to use data that I know I can legally reuse rather than using it from websites. Um, that said, I also know sometimes there's nothing else available and citing the source and saying we couldn't find any better sources than this. But here's the article I used for this information is probably, and I don't think I'd call it open data. I think I'd just call it data. Iman has the hand up. Yeah. Yeah, it is just to, uh, to, to maybe also clarify something regarding extracting information or statistics. It can be open data, in my opinion, sometimes, but always, especially when some national center, they uh, publish statistics and make it open. I, I'm not sure how it is licensed or not, but there is for some national statistical center, they have like published uh, article every month or every year where people can get statistics from it. So the source of it is open. So here also the, um, the meaning of data, is it not necessarily the research data or the project data? It can be documentary data or documentation. It can be a text, it can be statistics, tabulated, so anything. But is it under license or not? So also we need to distinguish, I think, what we are looking for is it just report that published and it has a license there or an image or an a code or but what he is asking is really good question but just uh, if i related to national statistics centers in any country they have publications of statistics where people use it and it is under the license of that center so yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, 
right i wanted to mention uh, if they have maybe if in the same article they have the data they used to generate the statistics so if you go back and maybe look if they do have that data and check if that data is open or not um yeah data they used to generate those statistics um right thank you yo um thank you man um right and then an important aspect like i was mentioning uh when using open data is stat citation uh to be able to use open data, you have to give credit where credit is due. So does this data have an ID? Things to always look at. Uh, data Does the data you're looking at have an ID or is, uh, is it in a repository which can be cited? Um, this is especially tricky with, uh, for example, GitHub resources. Um, uh, does it have a DOI? Um, so when they have a DOI, when they have an ID, this can be relatively easy to give to cite, um, but sometimes they do not, and that becomes a tricky part. Um, who um, who do I give credit to? So, like I've like we've seen in Zenodo, the example I gave, uh, it had an author, it had a uh, a tag, um, which was the description of the data set, it had the DOI, it had the location, it was on Zenodo. So um, when you're thinking about this, like I mentioned before, when you're thinking about it in a different persona, uh, you're not a user anymore, you're the creator of the open data, these aspects also come into, um, they become important when you're selecting the repository where you want your data to lie in. So um, a good repository will provide you with a guideline of all these things um, and they will help you to make your data properly citable. So um, the article that is on there is a very nice article or I found a very I found it as a very good read to act as a guide to selecting um, good uh, data repositories. So when you're thinking about um, uh, putting data in repositories and also it's also a good article to read when you want to know what's appropriate um, when citing data. So yeah, and then we also have, uh, when you're looking at open data, always look at the licenses. So what type of license is attached to this data? Different licenses allow you different permissions to do different things to the data. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, now we switch caps and uh, go into um, making open data. And uh, the first point uh, or the first plan always when you're thinking about making your data open is having a data management plan. And the data management plan is a document which defines how data um, is will be handled or is handled throughout the life cycle of a project. Um, it's usually the first thing you do. So just like you have a research plan for your data, you always have your DMP. Before you start collecting it, it's advisable that you uh, have this already set up. So um, in the next few minutes, we're going to be looking at uh, the different components of a data management plan and how we are going to put all this together to be able to allow us to think about how we make our data open. Right, so we have uh, different components of our data management plan. We have the um, description of the data and its related materials. So documentation, metadata, the quality, uh, quantity, just a good description of your data. Um, who is going to be handling the data and uh, the people with key responsibilities regarding that data. Uh, it's important to think about the security of the data, um, ethical issues that are attached to this data. So if you're working with sensitive data, not so sensitive data, um, intellectual properties and legal issues and all that. So uh, making data open. Uh, a description of your data. So 
when when you're in the user seat as you're using open data um you open a repository you find a good data set but this data set does not have it doesn't tell you the format of the data so for example maybe it's just an uh, an excel file but you open the excel file and you find that it's actually a comma separated file <laughs> um the images are distorted somehow um so always consider the format that you want to make uh that you want your data to be in when it's made open um and consider other people when you're using it so this has to be interoperable uh, by other users as well so um yeah think about the next person uh if you're using r but another person you know uh, other people within your field prefer to use python um can my file be read by a Python package, for example? Uh, yes, and maybe put this in a disclaimer or in a document somewhere. Um, so some uh, open data formats include CSV, some non-open data formats include doc and docs, uh, Photoshop, yeah, um, context, uh, as a user, it can be very frustrating, especially when you find data that you do not understand, you cannot make heads and tails of. Um, I'm going to share a personal experience. Um, when I'm trying to use Earth, Earth data, uh, that has been a roller coaster because you expect um, your metadata to look one way um, or more detail than your metadata, but it's you just don't find enough information within your metadata. So um, providing enough context for your users, for other people to be able to use your open data would be very considerable. So when you're making your data open, um, consider metadata and documentation. So I know you've done a lot, uh, talked a lot about metadata and readmes so just like uh believe Saranjit taught you guys about metadata uh this is where you find very useful information about uh your data set uh, you can also add within your metadata how to cite the data um uh where to find the data um legal guidelines and information about that data uh, and then in your documentation, you, you there you're allowed to add as much, 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 much detail as you can. So contact information, data collection methods. Um, it's like a long version, a longer, longer, longer version of the metadata. Uh, so keep your metadata brief and uh, in some cases um, uh, readable by a computer and then your documentation has to cater to the human reader so allow it to have all the context and all the information that it needs so yeah um so good practice to good practice for the um read me um uh, sessions that you've already had before yeah um and another thing about uh making data open um, consider what type of licenses your data needs. So licenses, uh, data licenses are legal agreements between the creator of the data and the end user specifying what users can do and cannot do to you uh, with the data or to your data. So it really minimizes the uh, situation where you have multiple formats of the same data and that data has been modified so much that it has lost its context. So uh, when you have a license attached to your data, it tells people what um, is restricted, what they cannot do, and and all that. And I found this resource quite interesting to use, um, how to fare. And it gives you a very good description about all the data licenses, very good explanations. Um, last time when we were doing this session, we had, um, I believe we had someone in the legal team 
and in a legal team and they explain some of these licenses. Um, and here is usually where there's usually a lot of questions and I usually just throw it over to you. So, <laughs> because yeah, I'm not uh, particularly uh, good at explaining most of these licenses, but um, yeah. Licensing is also a crucial way to, or uh, licenses are a crucial part of the checklist that is making your data open. Yeah, so we're talking about open. It's important to be open. Yes, we want to share with people. Our data has to be uni uh, it has to allow universal participation. Caring is caring, but when are we taking it too far? I always love asking this question. Um, and we've actually we've tried to answer it with the few discussions we've had, but uh, for like three minutes. Um, does anyone want to put in, the, uh, just put in the chat what you think is good to share, when it is a good idea to share your data, and when it is not a good idea to share your data, just three minutes, yeah, let's put it in the chat. And as people are doing it, if someone wants to uh, speak up and uh, tell us about a scenario where it was a good example, to share, good idea to share, and when it was not, that would be awesome also. I had a lot from Iman and Alan. Can I ask someone else to speak up? I'm looking for S's and let's see, Edmund Clark, be nice to hear you from you. Hello. Hello. So um, for me, uh, I think personally, I think uh, it's very good to share data. If uh, it can help me to to have more visibility for my research, for, for example, but uh, it can be not uh, good if uh, it uh, if it uh, can uh, have uh, how to say that if uh, because uh, in my country uh, which is Madagascar. Uh, it is very, very difficult to to make lessons. So, uh, for me, uh, I'm not able to make uh, data lessons. So, I think that uh, it's not good for me to, to share data without uh, lessons access. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, of forty seconds. Uh, you ask if it's good to share the location of a rare animal openly. You say no. <laughs> um, Benton says share data once you've published. Keep it under embargo. And still researching, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, uh, to share open data immediately. Uh, yes, Alan. Uh, I think it's good to share your data if you you're conversant with your findings, and that uh, you feel someone else would want to uh, use them. So yeah, yeah. Is it time up? <laughs> Keep talking. Sorry. 
Yeah. yeah, that's what I think. And if it isn't, and, and I think it's not good to share if you if you forge your data and uh, just to pass, uh, let's say, to beat a deadline, and you know that whoever is going to see the data won't find out. So something like that. <laughs> Why are we working with forged data in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, there were scenarios when we were still studying at campus. In order <laughs> to meet deadlines, <laughs> you just forge data because you know your lecturer won't find out. Oh, yikes. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I ask if it's appropriate to share data when uh, you've collected it yourself? Uh, under a PI, you've collected the data yourself, you are aware of all the open practices and you want to be open and say, yes, 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 I want to, I'm the one who has done this data collection and comfortable with it being open. Um, as the primary collector, I want to share this data. But your PI says, no, I don't want you to share this data because I have I'm the one who signs your papers and stuff. So in my, I, I as the PI, I say, no, is it appropriate to share your data then? Greens for yeses, uh, reds for no. Or thumbs up, any sort of reaction, yeah. Yes, you. I wasn't trying to say anything. I was going to try and put the red reaction on <laughs> and I pressed the wrong button. No, your says no. Good stuff. Excuse yes. me. Yeah, yeah. So what if I, I want to first consider, I want to first talk to him and tell him, you know, what would benefit if uh, uh, we share or what others would benefit after sharing? I believe I'm still in the middle. <laughs> yeah, this is a good question and it happens a lot. Uh, usually your PI has, um, yeah, there's usually hierarchy and um, will realize when you want to make your data open, it's not usually just your decision. There's a lot of people involved in um, the decision to make data open as much as we want to practice openness. Um, this is a heavy decision. So um, PIs, funders, um, I'm tempted to say as long as they sign your checks, maybe sometimes <laughs> uh, they restrict what is um, what is shareable and what is not. And uh, most times it impacts a lot the data. So your PI maybe sees a vision. Uh, I can have three more PhD students work with the same data set um, uh, to be able to generate some results. So you finished with the data, yes, but I still want more students to work on the data, work with the data. So as long as, yeah, you're good, yes, but we cannot allow sharing of the data. So um, these are just some of the scenarios. We have sensitive data. Sensitive data is usually not um, appropriate to share. Location data that will allow people to pinpoint where your is right now. That is not good to share. See, it, yeah, it brings fear into, um, yeah. Uh, military data, don't want people sharing military data. Um, so there's a lot of uh, restrictions and um, red tape when it comes to making data open. It's not usually just the researcher's decision, um, especially when this is attached to funding. Um, but we we are going to also, um, and one of the ways that people are managing to uh, turn this around or a solution to this is when you make your 
um, metadata available, uh, documenting how you've collected your data, uh, um, if you document how you've collected your data, people can be able to use the same methods to collect somewhat the exact same data set in a different environment maybe. And that is one way that you're being open. Um, if you describe your, yeah, you describe your data, um, it allows people to create synthetic data with the same. So Alan, when you were saying forged data, I would maybe say synthetic data. Um, you can generate synthetic data um, to be able to uh, do what you are not able to, um, to do uh, when the data is not available to you. So yeah, this is just some of the solutions that people are finding to take care of the issue of, we cannot share the data, but we do want the data to be open. So what can what else can we do? This is important data. How else can we make it available to others for use? Yeah. Um, and when also we're talking about sharing open data, uh, yeah, these are just some of the steps um, that allow you, uh, they can be a checklist um, to you creating data that can be shareable uh, with other people. Um, the key aspect here, I would say, is identifying, selecting and identifying a repository. Uh, there are a lot of institutional repositories, for example, Manchester has its own repo that allows people to uh, access data. Uh, but we also have public repositories like Zenodo. And uh, as a creator, um, these are some of the important decisions that you have to make. Um, I've attached a nice uh, article on how to select a good repository. So that also matters a lot. Um, and how they take care of you, how a repository takes care of your data. And you as a creator is also very important. It's an important decision to make. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we're short on time. We've gone over by 10 minutes. I'm going to ask for another 10 minutes that we put all these things that we have learned together into like a data management plan because we, that was the thing that we said is the first step to making our data open. And now that we have some knowledge on what are the important aspects of um, making our data open. So that has us thinking about how we put everything together. Yeah, you. We're good until half past. Oh, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> You're good, don't worry. <laughs> ah, right. Good. Then it allows us more time for actually for the hands-on exercise. And um, one of the tools that um, is very good to use for making data management plans, yeah, is DMP online. Um, so all those things that we have discussed, yes, um, when we want to make our data open, um, do we consider a funder? Um, what type of documentation, metadata, all that? We put it into a data management plan. So um, I'm going to walk you through this. And then after all this, if you want to try it out yourself, you can also try it out. Uh, this link goes to this. This is my own DMP um, account. And I found out that DMP also have a nice, uh, I can also look into my university's data management plans when I'm using it, which is really exciting for me. Um, right, so when you're at DMP, I'm sorry about that. I am um, 
Oh, and now I don't know how to hide all of your beautiful faces. Good stuff. Okay. Um, when you're using DMP, DMP online has a lot of publicly available uh, plans. So when you log in, for example, and you have an institutional um, institutional account, um, it gives you access to plans that are available to your um, by your university, but it also gives you access to other plans that um, are available online. Um, And when we go back, uh, when you want to create your own plan, you can search different plans um, or you can just create your own plan if your institution does not have any guidelines of um, any plans, you can just create a new one for yourself. So you just say create plan and then uh, what is your research project or what are you planning to do? Um, I want to do an international survey on open research practices, for example. So I'm going to say that this is a mock project for testing. Um, I mean to say I do not have an institution um, and when I, a primary funding organization, I also do not have one. If OLS, for example, is funding your study, this study, I would write down OLS. <laughs> so yeah, and then I would say create plan. So if we go back, um, this is important information to find out as you put as you're beginning your study or as you're uh, creating uh, your data management plan because maybe the funding uh, institution has different data sharing policies. So it is important that you look into the data sharing policies that um, get attached to the project immediately, they get funding from this institution. So we say create plan. Um, and it asks you now for all the details. So uh, all these are just steps into like the different steps that you're going to go through as you create your whole plan. So um, all those things that we said um, are important, the components, maybe have them written down separately and then do each and every one of them uh, as you're filling in the details of your DMP, for example. So a project abstract, this, for example, you would maybe have in your documentation. Um, give it a good abstract, give it enough information. Um, I'm going to skip this part. I'm going to just um, copy the same. This is an example of bad practice. What I'm doing now is an example of very, very bad practice. Um, write a good abstract that to accompany your data management plan. So if that even when you give it to your um, PI or supervisor, they appreciate what, the work that you've done. Um, your research domain, it gives you uh, a list of domains. I'm going to select education. Um, let's say our project begins today and ends 30th of November, it's going to generate an ID for you automatically. So um, you don't have to do that yourself. So this ID you're able to share with other people. Um, if your research is going to have uh, ethical concerns, so at this point you select, it will have ethical concerns. And um, so for example, in my university, I'm able to um, go back to ethics and ask, all the questions that um, uh, all the questions that I have concerning making my data available to other people, or what type of details do I do I put in my data management plan concerning ethics? Yeah. So we have different protocols for 
ethics um who who do I report to or who, who who does a participant? For example, my study will involve surveys. So if I break any um, agreements on that survey, who does a participant go to? Um, funder, you have to put their information on there. Most times, funders also have DOIs. So uh, that's you would put in the their information there. Um, the funding status, if you know, you just put it on there. This is information, again, that you can get from your PI or your supervisor. And funding institutions also usually have a grant number, so that you just put there. When you say save, it saves your plan on there. Uh, you can add as many people uh, as contributors to this. So this stage is where you would add your PI, for example or your supervisor, um, I believe it's just an email, their name, their orchid, and who exactly they are. Yeah. Um, you plan an overview. Uh, th this, is, this gives you the overview of your whole plan. So um, data collection, um, documentation, you, you're going to require documentation and metadata. So have that ready already. Um, any information on ethics and legal compliance, where you're going to store the data, very important. Um, data sharing, if you have data sharing practices that are different, uh, find out from your institution, find out from your funders and other people who are responsible for this data as well. Um, if you're going to put this data up on like Zenodo, for example, um, uh, that repository is responsible for like data management. So you'd have to put that information on there. And then we start writing the plan. Um, and if I say expand all, it can look very daunting, but actually it isn't. Once you have all your information in one place, it's actually a very good, it's a simple process or not simple. It's yes, do a, just, uh, I won't tell you, we have 10 minutes left. Yeah, okay. it's finishing up now. Um, as you go through the steps, it gives you descriptions if you're unsure um, what to consider and all that. Yeah, um, if you have research outputs that you already know, you can put this on there. And then eventually you can share um, with other people to edit. You can also request feedback. For example, I can request feedback from my university. And then once you're done, you can download it in different formats to attach to your research plan. Yeah, this is just, um, this is a very useful tool. Um, it has a very good database, has very many um, openly available data management plans or templates. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel or start thinking about other ones. Just um, go to DNP online and try it out. Um, yeah. Okay. It's a lot of information. Um, in like very quickly. So at this point, any questions? Very welcome. All the links are available in the slides. Yeah. Ah, Yo says I am, yes, me, Yo is an alumni, so I am going to try and find all her DMPs and just copy paste. Any questions, um, feel free to ask, yeah. So this website is free for anyone, even if our institution is not there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you.
just one more thing. I'm working on actually a project measuring the awareness and the practice of open data in my university among acad uh, faculties and uh, researchers. So I already prepared like a survey. If I want someone from here, like like you or anyone in uh, in open science or in mainly in open data can give me feedback on that. Sure. Maybe. In... Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. You have to do so. I wonder if we should wrap up or is there anything else that you wanted to cover, Pauline? Um, no, that was the end of my presentation. Yes. Uh, and I hope to see everyone during the uh, together session. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Pauline. And thank yeah. you, everyone, for attending today. Uh, if you uh, have any question, we have also the Slack channel. You can put your questions there. And um, don't uh, forget for our next work call, it will be Wood Module. It will be on t t Tuesday, November 12th. And don't forget about your coaching sessions. Uh, if you don't fill your... Uh, for, um, uh, form till now please fill up and uh, be ready for your co coaching session if you still have any question don't forget to put it on the slack again and thank you for attending for today thank you pauline thank you you thank you everyone what 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 coaching sessions it's coaching sessions do you want me to get it, Dot? Yes, you can. Sure. Um, so um, we can send around the template again. Um, but the idea is that we have experts on the team uh, within RLS, including people like Pauline, who um, will meet with groups of two to three of you um, to answer specific questions. So for example, if you had questions about data management or, or you had questions about writing open code, then, you, then as a group, you can spend some time chatting with the coaches um, to get more information and basically like open topic specific Q&A sessions with up to between one and three participants in each session. So we'll be sending out more information about that probably uh, tomorrow. Um, if not tomorrow, it'll be Monday. Irene is not really in the office this week. <laughs> Thank you, you. And before we ending our session, anyone have any question? Tanya, you still have uh, any question? Uh, no, but uh, Tuesday I couldn't uh, attend the lecture because I have a field trip. And unfortunately, uh, I couldn't be able to uh, make coaches. So, uh, no problem. <laughs> well, we can meet them again in other uh, session. Yeah. yeah, I think there'll be a few other days apart from just the Tuesday. We'll send more information by email very soon. Okay, thank you. Is these slides are available? You share these slides. Yeah, I put them up in the front part. Yeah. How we can access them? Uh, it's uh anyone who has a link can just download them. Uh, they're on Google Slides. Is the link is the link in the notes? Yes. Yeah. Included in the notes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Also, I put it in the chat for everyone. You can find any slides in the note and uh, you can find it now in the chat too. Thank you everyone for attending.
and we can stop share recording now thank you bye